Good morning. It's time for our midweek Bible study. So we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. We're in Mark chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 7 and try to work our way down through about verse 19 uh, with this. And there are a couple of things that, that are interesting about this passage that we'll be looking at. Um, first, of course, is just how strong the uh, influence of Jesus has grown, that we, that, as we'll see as this passage is, as we go through it. And then the second thing that's of interest, I think, in this passage is, finally here in chapter 3, Mark gives us the names of all of the apostles, the, the 12 closest men that Jesus is going to spend the majority of his time, really, probably pouring himself into. And so we'll get their names uh, as Mark lists them. And we'll talk about the differences between Mark's gospel and some of the other gospels as well. So let's begin at Mark chapter 3, uh, verses 7 and 8. Then we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll start diving into to God's word this morning. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Ijemea and from beyond the Jordan and from beyond Tyre and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. So, Father, we pause here, as always, Lord, and we ask you, help us to understand, help us to see, and help us to apply what we see. We thank you, Father, for your word and what it means in our lives. Just help it, Lord, now to take root that it might help shape us into the people you desire us to be. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there's something to be said about withdrawing to a quiet place. Um, and wherever that quiet place might be, I think it's always helpful. Jesus here, of course, withdraws from the city area, probably possibly of Capernaum, and he, and he moves to the, the shore. Uh, the Sea of Galilee, most likely, is where, what we're talking about here. <clears throat> and, and, you know, I know I enjoy uh, the beach uh, as a place of peace and rest. I'm not much of one to go out and get in the water and swim. And I'm certainly not much of one to go out and get a suntan. Um, but I can sit and watch the waves roll in for a long time. And it's almost like the stress just kind of pours off of me as I just sit and watch the, the, the waves roll in. I used to do it when I was on active duty in the Navy, when I was feeling stressed out or something. I'd go out on the main deck of our ship and just watch the ocean swells. It is helpful to do that. Uh, now I'm not sure if Jesus was affected the same way by the shore, but perhaps it did have somewhat of a calming influence even on him. And so he withdrew out of the city and he, and he withdrew to, to the seashore, but a great crowd followed. And so regardless of his intent, if his intent was to kind of withdraw and get away from the people, the people followed now, the, this great crowd, and this is interesting to me, at least in the Greek, uh, the, the word crowd itself uh, comes, I think, from the Greek word plethos, or, or uh, with, from which we get our word plethora. So that in and of itself talks of a large number. But then Mark adds another word in front of it, great, to give the idea that it's even larger, that it, it's a multiplication of the f first word of the crowd, so the, the implication here is that this was not just a few people. This was a massive crowd. And he describes where the people come from, because these are not just the people of Galilee, the people from the city of Capernaum. But he says, actually, we had people coming up from Judea. Now, Judea is south of the region of Galilee. Uh, and in fact, Samaria is between, and Samaria is skipped here, but... There may have also been people out of Samaria, obviously, coming up. He says, all the way to Jerusalem, we had people coming. Jerusalem being the capital, uh, really, of Judea. But then he says, we also had people coming from Ijumea. Well, that's south of Judea. The homeland of, the homeland of the Edomites is south of Judea. And that's the, the area that he said people were coming from. And he said, we have people coming from beyond the Jordan River. Well, that's the area east of the Jordan. He said, we had people coming all the way from Tyre and Sidon. 
which are coastal cities to the north and west of Galilee. So in other words, what Mark is describing here is that this crowd of people has come from all around the region, centered in Galilee, but to the north and west, to the east, to the south, people are coming. And what are they coming for? They heard all that he was doing. That's what they're coming for. They were attracted by what Jesus was doing. <clears throat> now, we can make a point here, I think. Because what Jesus was doing was a manifestation, obviously, of his own divine nature. It was a proof, if you will, of what he was preaching. The people didn't come to hear him preach. The people came to see him do something. The majority of the people that were being attracted to Jesus weren't attracted by his message. They were attracted by the miracles. Their motivation was wrong. And certainly, Jesus healing people of lifelong illnesses and, and, and abnormalities and casting out demons, that kind of activity is going to draw, draw attention and it's going to draw a crowd. The reason why Jesus was doing it wasn't to draw the crowd, it was to reinforce his message. But the people weren't necessarily there to hear the message. They were there to watch the excitement. Not necessarily what Jesus wanted. Certainly probably more an unintended consequence, if you will. But here's this large crowd. They've gathered now. And there's nothing that can be done to stop this. We pick it up in verse 9 down through verse 12. And he, Jesus, told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirit saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. So this crowd, even as we see here, you know, Mark describes it as a great crowd in, in the first couple of verses here. And then Jesus says, you know what? They're all pressing around. They're all trying to touch him. They, they want the healing that he can provide. And so they're all pressing around him. And he says, you know what? I'm about to get crushed here. Get a boat ready. Because what, what Jesus would do would get in a boat and push off from the shore. And in this case, it's not so much to provide a, an easy pulpit, but it's just to protect um, any crowd that is as large as what Mark seems to be describing can be dangerous, even unintentionally so. And, and there's no indication that the crowd had an evil intent, but Jesus is just being practical here. He says, you know what? They're going to crush me if I stay here. Get a boat ready so we can push off here a little ways. And again, the motivation of the crowd, I think, is apparent. They all want to touch. They're not there necessarily to listen. They're there to be healed. Um, anyone who could get to Capernaum, if this is the area where it is, was there to try and do one thing. They wanted to be healed, whatever their affliction was. But there is the other side of this as well. And, and we've seen this through Jesus' ministry. He's doing two things. He's healing, and he's healing people that, Medicine alone is not going to heal. Um, but there's also the issue of the unclean spirits, the demonic possessions. <clears throat> and those who were possessed by those demonic spirits were also responding. And it, whenever Jesus would come around, it, the people would fall down and the voices would cry out, you are the son of God. Revealing the identity of, uh, of Jesus as far as his divine nature. And Jesus, of course, would command them, remain silent. Now, all of this, and let's, let's be clear here. We've talked about this before. Mark is not a chronologically accurate depiction of the ministry of Jesus. So what Mark is describing here with the large, large crowd and, and the healings and the demonics, uh, you know, the demonically possessed 
crying out. All of this quite probably took place over an extensive period of time, uh, months at least probably. And it may have not all transpired near Capernaum. There were other locations certainly that Jesus would have gone to. And so Mark is revealing to us a commonality. This is what was commonly happening whenever Jesus would go to a location for any length of time. He would be thronged with a massive amount of people seeking the miracles. And there would be those among them who were possessed of evil spirits who would cry out and Jesus would command them to be silent. And so this is what Mark is describing to us here. The ministry of Jesus, this is what it had come to within a relatively short period of time after Jesus began his public ministry. And so this is where Mark has brought us to now. This is an understanding of the magnitude of the ministry of Jesus. And he's done that for a reason, because the next section here, verses 13 through 19, is an introduction of the 12. So let's take a look at that. And he, Jesus, went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to, who, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So we finally get to the names of the twelve. And you may wonder, well, why has Mark waited so long to do this? Because obviously it did take some time to bring these twelve men together. And I think, as I said before, that early depiction that Mark has given us in the first few verses, seven through, uh, you know, seven and eight there, with the great crowds and the throngs and, and how Jesus was unable to manage those large crowds by himself brings us to the point of why he wanted to call 12 people to become his apostles. So let's first talk about that word apostle. Uh, Literally, it means a a commissioned messenger. They have a specific message to, to bring and to deliver, and they are commissioned by one who has authority to give a commission. Um, In this case, obviously, God. (laughs) And so, um, the narrative makes it clear that you know, Jesus' ministry has progressed to a point that he needs an organization to help support. He can't minister to everybody himself. It's too large now. Um, and these 12, while they're called to him on the mountain, and he appoints them as his apostles, understand that they had probably gone through the same process that Matthew had gone through and that Peter and and, and Andrew had gone through and and James and John had gone through. In other words, it probably began with a somewhat casual, almost informal friendship where he knew these men already. He had had interactions with them. So he was not a complete stranger to them. They had probably also been called to follow him just as Matthew and Peter and Andrew and James and John had been called to follow him. So they had been called into the group of, of followers, which understand was probably a little bit larger than you may imagine. There were quite probably 50 or 60 or so that commonly were following Jesus wherever he went. But now Jesus is calling them to something more. Not just to be in constant attendance, like maybe the like I said, the 30, 40, 50, whatever were there for. But now he's appointing them, as he said, apostles. He's giving them a message. And it's a message that is backed up by his authority as God. This is a deeper relationship. This is not just going to be, hey, you're going to be hanging around with me every day. This is going to be, I'm going to be pouring myself into you in a very special way. Now, there's no indication of the timing of this, you know, when it happened in in the timeline of his ministry. Mark doesn't give us that. But we are told that Jesus called these 12 men specifically to his location. Again, how he did that, we don't know. 
but he made a deliberate choice. 12 men. Why 12? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why 12? Well, perhaps it is a callback to the 12 tribes of Israel. And some of the names of the apostles even are related to the tribes of Israel. Matthew was also known as Levi, which is obviously the tribe of Levi. Simon, whom Jesus also called Peter, uh, that's a form of Simeon, which is a tribe of Israel. And Judas, of course, is a form of Judah. So at least three or four of the, the disciples had direct ties in their names to the names of the tribes of Israel. And, and we couldn't make much of this, but, and, and I do believe there's a connection here. I think it is related to the people of God. And 12 is that number. 12 tribes of Israel and 12 apostles. But we're also told of their commission, which is important, I think. Because a lot is made today of some men claiming apostolic authority, claiming an apostolic relationship with Jesus. And Jesus himself here says, this is going to be your commission Look again at what he said in, in this verse. He appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him. These 12 men had a very special relationship to Jesus. Now, I know there's no direct word in Scripture that says that apostleship has ended. But Jesus himself said, I'm calling you to be apostles, and here's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be with me. Now, while we certainly have the Spirit of God who indwells us now, we are no longer capable of physically being in the presence of Jesus. These 12 men were. And even after the death of Jesus and his resurrection and ascension, when they decided to replace Judas Iscariot, the 11 said, we need to make sure that this is a man who was an eyewitness, if you will, of the work of Jesus. So to me, there's a very real sense in which the office of apostle has ceased on this planet. And I don't say that to be disrespectful of any other faith group that holds to an apostolic authority and, and believes that maybe even their leader is an apostle. But I would encourage you to look at this because... I'm just not sure it still exists. But they would be with Jesus, which implies that intimacy of relationship beyond what any of the other followers of Jesus might experience. And this is another reason why, for me today, the, the idea of someone formally being an apostle, it, it, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth, I guess, because it, it implies a depth of relationship that nobody else has. And as far as I can tell, that's not true of today. We are all open to have that depth of relationship with Jesus. The same spirit indwells all of us. There's no, there's no special relationship that any one of us can have that goes beyond what anybody else can have. The second thing, of course, they were sent out to preach the message of the kingdom of God, the message of the gospel. They would be sent to preach. And then thirdly, it said, they would have authority to cast out demons. They would have great authority granted to them, enough authority to, to wield power over the demonic. And so we see this special relationship formed, these 12 men, and, and it was all, it says, whom he desired. Whom he desired. Not necessarily looking at the future potential. Not looking at current devotion necessarily even. But simply whom he desired. Whom he would choose. And then... Finally, Mark gives us the names. Uh, now, there are four places in the New Testament where the apostles are listed. Uh, Mark is one, Matthew is another, 
the Gospel of Luke is a third, and then the Book of Acts, where the eleven at least are named. All four lists suggest that there were essentially three groups of four men, and all four of the recordings of the apostles' name imply that each group was led, if you will, by a different man. Uh, the first group of four was led by Simon Peter. Uh, the third, uh, second group was led by Philip. And the third group was led by James, the son of Alphaeus. And so all four of the listings tend to give the same uh, impression here as to kind of how the, the, the apostles themselves were sort of organized. In all four lists, the first name on it is that of Simon, whom Jesus called Peter, always listed first in all four records. And of course, um, Peter is the, uh, the, the anglicized version of the Greek name Petra, which means rock. Um, he was also sometimes, you'll see him called Cephas, which is, um, I believe, the, the, the Hebrew version of that. Um, and remember, there is a point in the ministry of Jesus where Jesus is asking his disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter is the one who said, you are the son of God, you are the Christ. And Jesus said, upon this, I will build my church upon that rock solid foundation of faith. Uh, so Simon, whom Jesus would call Peter or Petra or Cephas. Then comes James, the son of Zebedee, whom Jesus called Boanerges, the sons of thunder, along with his brother John, who was most likely the younger brother, of course. And then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. That first group of four. Then we come Philip, who's always fifth in the list of the apostles. Um, we know that he was from the same hometown as Simon and Andrew. Uh, then comes Bartholomew. Bartholomew is the next name. Uh, in John's gospel, you don't see the name Bartholomew. You do see the name of Nathaniel. And so many interpreters believe that Bartholomew and Nathaniel are the same man. Um, then comes Matthew, also known as Levi. And we've already, of course, been introduced to him. Thomas, sometimes also called Didymus. Uh, both of those names mean twin, Thomas in Aramaic, Didymus in Greek. And then James, the son of Alphaeus. This is quite possibly also the apostle sometimes known as James the Less. Uh, he may have also been a brother to Matthew because Matthew's father's name was also Alphaeus. Although that's tenuous, we, we don't know that specifically. We're not told that both... Uh, James and Matthew had the same father, but they do both have the same name. And so it's possible that James was a brother of Matthew. Thaddeus is the next name that Mark lists. Um, he was also known in the other gospels, you, you would see him named as Judas, not the Judas who betrays Jesus. Um, and it is also quite possible that Thaddeus was the brother of James. James Alphaeus, the son of Alphaeus, James the Less, and Thaddeus may have been brothers, in which case they are also then brothers possibly of Matthew. So um, there's, you know, we know, of course, Simon and, and, and Andrew were brothers, James and John were brothers, and there may be more family connections here as well, obviously. And then comes Simon who was known as Simon the Zealot, or in some Gospels you see him listed as Simon the Canaanite. Um, both Zealot, Zelotes, and, and Canaanite seem to indicate a political affiliation. And, and most interpreters believe that Simon the Zealot had been a political zealot, seeking the freedom of Israel politically from the domination of Rome. And then always listed last in all the Gospels, is Judas Iscariot. Um, and that last name Iscariot, the, the meaning is not wholly clear, but it is possible that what it is, is uh, there is a village that was known as Kerioth uh, there in the, the region of Palestine. And it may have been that Judas came from 
Kerioth. So Iscariot would be a form of that to say Judas who came from Kerioth. And as I said, he is always listed last. And there is a tragic note to the listing of Judas Iscariot. The question is asked, did Jesus know that Judas was going to betray him? And I think the only possible answer we can come up with is absolutely, yes. He knew that Judas would be the man to betray him. Mark paints that, Judas Iscariot, who would betray him. But there's also another reality that we need to see here, and that is this. Judas was not forced to betray Jesus. He would choose to do so. We are not forced to betray our Lord. If we do it, we choose to do it. And so we all should be very careful, I believe, of our relationship with Jesus uh, and how we steward that relationship because we are all responsible for it. Um, while God is a sovereign God, I do not believe that he foreordains all of our choices. I believe in the free will of man before, during, and after salvation. And how we steward that relationship with Jesus is important. And I hope you'll take that, that message today and that lesson. Take it in and, and, and put that in your heart. We must steward our relationship with Jesus. Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you, Father, again for your word and all that you, you give to us. May you use this today to your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you next week.